Time now for Back Pages tonight here on Sky Sports News as we bring you a first look at the sports stories in the morning's newspapers. And joining us tonight are the Mirrors Chief Football Writer John Cross and the Athletics Football Correspondent David Ornstein. Very warm welcome to you both. Let's so quickly run through the Back Pages as we have them right now. The back Page of the Times leads with the news that Wolves want to take uh, VAR to a Premier League vote to scrap the technology <laughs> from next season. The Image, by the way, there is uh, from uh, Old Trafford with the line, Diallo delivers but Rashford rouse after Marcus Rashford appeared to argue back uh, to a fan in the stands during the warm-up. Plus, Thomas Tuchel could be staying at Bayern. Another U-turn, similar to that of Xavi at Barcelona. On the front page of the Telegraph sports section, Wolves declare war on VAR and also silent assassin Hoyland takes heat off Ten Hag after that. 3-2 win for Manchester United against Newcastle in the race for European football. Also in the Telegraph, Keith Hackett's referees view column, make these changes in VAR or scrap it for good. An opinion piece there. And we've got plenty more on that story and indeed the night's football in the Premier League and the Scottish Premiership. OK, so let's start off with the news that Premier League clubs will be asked to vote on the possible abolition of video assistant referees for next season after a proposal tabled by Wolves. Um, I'm sure, you know, John and David, you've both got plenty to say on this, but David, I know you, you broke this story. So how much of a seismic development is this? That something which the Premier League have backed, they want to be part of its evolution, its development, Im implementation, could be outvoted by Premier League clubs. Tell us a little bit more. Well, you said the Premier League have backed, David, but that's the 20 member clubs that have backed the introduction of VAR because they voted for it in the first place. And now I think it's only Sweden in Europe's top 30 divisions that does not have VAR. And we've seen it evolve over the last five years in the Premier League. Um, those five years have been riddled by controversy, incident after incident. Um, it does seem that we're talking more about things like VAR, PSR, than the actual football itself on a regular basis. Um, and there's a great sense of dissatisfaction. Uh, this season, we've had a number of high-profile incidents that have led to letters of complaint, to questions about the integrity of the competition and of the officials, unhappy clubs and managers and players and fans. And Wolves have actually been pretty hard done by, possibly the worst, depending on what statistics you look at. But it's taken... Um, somebody to actually put their head above the parapet and, and speak up. To this point, that hadn't happened, but it has now. And so Wolves decided to write to the Premier League. And uh, as I revealed on The Athletic, they formally submitted a um, representation um, to the Premier League, uh, a letter that has now been published. And, and that means that resolution will go to the shareholders meeting in Harrogate on the 6th of June, um, and it will be voted upon the uh, idea being to uh, get rid of VAR uh, from the start of next season. Now, it needs a uh, two-thirds majority, which would be 14 of the 20 uh, member clubs. And um, who knows if that's going to happen? I mean, initial reactions suggest it, it might not. Um, but clearly, there's the possibility of it happening. And it's conjured huge debate because uh, this appears to be one of the most divisive issues in football at the moment. Um, and so we'll have to see how it goes in early June. Uh, of course, the Premier League clubs only recently voted unanimously to bring in semi-automatic offsides from next season. Um, and if this vote goes against VAR, then all of that is scrapped, goal line technology and everything. So, yeah, it's a, a massive moment and we'll have to see how it plays out. Thank you for all of that context, David. Um, just looking at the statement that was made by Wolves and, and you know, their communication on this, saying that they think that VAR has led to numerous unintended negative consequences that are damaging the relationship between fans and football and undermining the value of the Premier League brand. I'm going to come back to that last bit in a moment. This has been covered in your paper, John, in, in the mirror. Scrap VAR. Wolves want support from other clubs to ditch video systems. So firstly, do you sense that Wolves would have already got a, a, an idea of who else they can bring along with them when this goes to a vote in the AGM, before even mentioning this statement? But also, what kind of um, 
how problematic is this for the Premier League? And, as they say in their statement, the brand of the Premier League? Because we want to have amazing football. We want to have these high-scoring games. And we want to have that sort of spontaneous passion of the moment. But VAR is affecting the spectacle. It really is, yeah. Look, first and foremost, what a cracking um, scoop by David. Uh, brilliant story. And it really has put it in the mixer, hasn't it? And, and, and made us all debate it, made us all talk about it. Personally, I don't know whether whether David agrees that I just can't see it getting 14 votes to 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 get through. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that if you suddenly went back on it, it would leave, I think, English clubs at a great disadvantage in the European competition mm. because basically all of a sudden you'd be playing without um, uh, uh, VAR in, in the Premier League, but you'd be using it in European games. Well, I mean, that would really be difficult. And I think that's the first hurdle. And I think that's the first thing that any club in Europe would, would you know, put up. Have Wolves kind of sought opinion? Listen, I'd be amazed if they, if they hadn't put in some calls. To what extent that support has been garnered and gained it is, I don't know, probably conjecture, isn't it? I mean, I wouldn't have thought that sort of kind of Nottingham Forest would... Would, would would not be picking up the phone in, in support, frankly, mm. and, and and so on. But look, there's been individual incidents that have affected Wolves, you know, negatively and positively. I was at Old Trafford opening weekend of the season on that Monday night when I mean it was absolutely farcical. I went from where I was sat, and it was so obvious that Onana had con conceded a penalty, and and yet it still wasn't overturned on VAR. And yet you had that goal recently. You know that they were very unhappy about against West Ham the potential equaliser, um, and and obviously I think that sort of as almost feels like it's tipped them over the edge on this one. Um, and I, ju I just feel there's been incidents along the way, um, really, that they're, they're clearly unhappy about. Wolves, I think, as, as much as anyone feel that they've been wronged, they've been targeted. I Personally, I think that's a bit of paranoia. Um, I do think they've probably been unlucky as, as compared to everyone else. The stats are, are fascinating, aren't they? Because the, the, the Premier League tell us that, that basically before pre-VAR, 82% of decisions um, uh, um, are correct uh, as compared to 96. Now, that's near perfect. I know a lot of people will say, well, that's 4%. So, you know, what is that? I mean, it's, you know, it's it's still quite high when you're looking for perfection from video technology. I, I, I don't think they should scrap VAR. I thought it would be much better than it has been. I thought it would take effect and be much more positive for the game um, than it has. I think Keith Hackett raises some really good points in his piece um, about sort of having teams. Um, I think the biggest single thing for me is the fan in the stadium is 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 a second-class citizen when it comes to VAR. They do not know what's going on. They're kept in the dark, and it's completely unfair. And I think that really, that above everything else, winds me up. Well, well David mentioned this point before about uh, SAOT or SAOT or another kind of, mm -hmm. you know, abbreviation or, 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 or acronym we're going to have next season of semi-automated offside technology. I think that's right. And that that might, might well be coming in um, and we know that you know Howard Webb has talked about this and said that this is this you know potential next season as indeed is the possibility um, although IFAB might not have it of referees trying to explain decisions made to to the crowd and that's something that between PJ and IFAB perhaps needs to be resolved but I, I want to come back to one of the words you you mentioned John which was conjecture because this is what this all is right now we, we should be talking about one of the most compelling title races in years. We should be talking about one of the most compelling t uh, battles of, against relegation in, in years. But instead, it's those, those three-letter abbreviations of PSR and VAR that seem to be dominating the headlines. And surely, this is not what the Premier League want for us to be talking about these kind of things rather than the incredible product and spectacle which is English top-flight football. Yeah, I, look, listen, I agree. I think it's sad, a sad reflection on the game. I remember watching um, over sort of kind of just into the New Year period, um, Aston Villa's FA Cup game at Middlesbrough. And, it, it, you know, you could celebrate a goal and not worry about it being potentially offside. I mean, look, even I was watching the game tonight at Old Trafford. Main who's played onside. But, it, you know, because you haven't got kind of um, Kieran Trippier out of shot... I'm thinking, oh, well, he's offside. You know, he's put that ball in so casually, it's offside. And so you have no reaction, you have no fun. 
And that's the point, isn't it? It's taken away the fun element of it. I think the semi-automated offsides is a huge step forward. That will transform decisions next season. It will speed them up and, and, and really make a difference. Um, and I do think that that will help um, beyond a shadow of a doubt. We cannot go back, guys. We can't. It would be farcical now. There's massive areas that I think can be improved, but we can't go back. It was always going to take time. I think Howard Webb is making a difference. He is making changes, but it is going to be, you know, it's going to be a difficult one to um, sort of see out. But I do think he needs time, a bit more patience, and I think this is the wrong way to go. But at least it gets us talking about it and hopefully making some improvements. Yeah, uh, David, I, I wanted to kind of put back to you something that John said a little bit earlier about, you know, doesn't think that it will get 13 more votes along with Wolves to get this passed. Let's just, I suppose, be hypothetical here. If, let's say, it did get passed, then what would that mean? What kind of potential ripple effect could it have in terms of the global game and its direction and also the Premier League to be the only one of the top five European leagues not to have it? And again, the effect on how it's perceived and all the others to have it. I mean, that's presumably a line they really don't want to go down. Yeah, I think it would be chaos, David, because there has been so much invested into this project over such a long period of time uh, in this country and on the global level as well. Um, financially, as much as anything, the clubs in the Premier League, the shareholders have ploughed their own finance into it. And I don't think it would sit easily with them to just scrap it all. As the Premier League point out, the number of correct decisions have improved. So technically, we're in a better position from an accuracy point of view. Uh, but it's just what's surrounding it that that has brought so much um, sort of fractious reaction. And I think for, for some people, it would be it would be welcome to return to the natural uh, elements that we had before, even when mistakes were made. You got on with things because there wasn't the technology uh, that's become such a talking point. Um, but for others, uh, you know, there is no turning back. And, and I suspect that will be the case because, um, as I said, the, the shareholders, the, the clubs voted unanimously for semi-automated offsides. So that gives us an indication of where this vote might go. What I suspect might happen now is that the clubs see how these new developments come on, the semi-automated offsides, the possible um, in-stadium referee communication. And if those improvements um, bring steps forward and the standard of officiating improves and, and certain elements we've already got in VAR get better, then maybe we'll be in a good position. If they don't, then perhaps they'll stage another vote in the future. So maybe if this one doesn't pass, um, we could see it revisited further down the line. And it brings me back to a couple of points. Firstly, um, the standard of officiating. Our experience in, say, the Champions League and the World Cup um, indicates that VAR, the technology, might not be the problem, but it's actually the people operating it who maybe are, um, and and therefore perhaps it's Howard Webb and his team and the focus on um, what's happening with the actual people um, that will be the real issue here rather than the technology technology itself. OK, well, I guess 6th of June, that's a, a date we're already hmm. having to circle in our diaries for the next uh, for the next meeting. Um, that's great. There's a lot, a lot on that subject. I'm sure this is story is going to continue to develop. Um, John and, uh, and, and David, for the moment, thank you. We're going to take a quick break. Other side of which, we'll come back and look at more of the back pages and plenty of other talking points too beyond VAR, including this in The Times as we focus on Manchester United beating Newcastle 3-2 at Old Trafford to boost their European champions. But Marcus Rashford appears to have a row with a fan in the crowd. You're watching Back Pages tonight. Welcome back to you, watching at home. Welcome back to the Mirrors Chief Football Writer, John Cross, and also the Athletics Football Correspondent, David Ornstein. OK, let's talk about the Premier League football of the evening and um, the result at Old Trafford. Manchester United 3, Newcastle 2. Life never dull at the Theatre of Dreams. Um, and in the back of the Times, uh, Diallo delivers but Rashford rows, and there is a, a picture of uh, Ahmed Diallo... Uh, celebrating his goal. Great hit for the second, having set up the first. 
but Marcus Rashford, who argued with a supporter in the sands, it would appear. Life is never simple either. There's always, there's always a cloud along with the silver lining when it comes to Manchester United. Um, John, if I could come to you uh, for this one. Um, I mean, it's an important result for United in terms of trying to, you know, salvage something from their season, but Eric Ten Hag to keep putting himself in the right place to try and secure his future at the club as well. How significant do you feel it was? Yeah, I thought it was significant because I thought it was a good performance. I thought at the end, um, you, you might have caught some of his kind of speech, um, end of season, the kind of the lap of appreciation, as they call it now. Um, so it's appreciating the fans rather than the other way round in Man United's case, obviously. <laughs> um, um, and basically saying we've got the best fans in the world. Well, I mean, if that's not a clear, clear message to try and get them back on side, I don't know what is really. I, d I do think it's in it's in the melting pot because, you know, I mean, we'll probably come on to it, but but sort of kind of t is Tuchel staying at Bayern? Is you know the, the the dates don't appear to align for Gareth Southgate? I'm sure that Gareth Southgate, the amazing job that he's done as England manager, would make him a very attractive proposition for for a top club. And but you know he's he's contracted and he can't speak to clubs during the Euros, and he's not about to sort of kind of break that trust. So uh, and where do United go from here? So it almost feels like Ten Hag, you know, is still in there fighting, believing that he's got a chance of keeping this job. And I don't think he's lost that faith. I, I, it'll be interesting to see which way it goes, but I don't think it, anything is set in stone, really. And so kind of performances like that, I mean, Hoyland off the bench, you know, scoring a really good goal. That that earlier strike was terrific, wasn't it? Good performances, battling performances. Even Casemiro put in some defensive heroics. So, you know, we, we've, we've seen a lot tonight. And look, while United have still got a Wembley final to come, they've still got the prospects of, therefore, of European football, um, you know, they've still got something to play for. It did feel like a big result because they dug deep on Sunday, didn't quite come off for them against Arsenal, but it did against Newcastle. And I do think that Ten Hag will be looking at that and said, mm, hopefully that's a message. Yeah, I'm wondering, David, is this... I suppose a little bit with the way that Dave, that John has described that an indication an illustration of how maybe not just the manager but certain players feel that they've got to prove themselves and their value knowing that there might be a bit of a shake up at Old Trafford in the summer what's your what's your reading what, what's your take on what was seen at Old Trafford tonight both on the pitch in terms of the game and Eric Ten Hag and his declarations afterwards yeah, well, one swallow doesn't make a summer. And so it won't just be judged on the basis of tonight as good as it was. It will be across the whole uh, season or at least since Ineos have come in and they'll be watching what's happening on the pitch, what's happening off and around the pitch, on the training ground, behaviours, style of play, character of everybody there at sort of every level. And so um, this was a sign to me that the players are still battling away and, and fighting for Eric Ten Hag. He hasn't, uh, to coin the <laughs> wearied phrase, lost the dressing room, it would seem. Uh, I'm sure there are there are some unhappy players at every club and, and Man United will be no different. But that was a, that was a good performance and, and he seemed to stir the, the crowd up heading towards the cup final. I actually thought that was a really good speech on, on the pitch. He was... Um, he was impassioned and, and it seemed to go down relatively well. But let's not get away from the fact that his future is in the balance. You know, the, the Ineos hierarchy will be weighing up what to do now. They'll be looking at him on the one hand and, and also looking at potential replacements as, as they have to do if a, a change is going to be made. He will also be looking at it as well. David, because he's only got a year left on his contract. Yes, there's an option to extend beyond that, but it seems that he would be wanted by clubs around Europe if he Too was cool available. Does he want to be? Does he want to be part of this regime? So, yeah, it's um, there's a lot to sort out there. It was a good night, but it, it it doesn't mean it changes the bigger picture that huge decisions await uh, most likely after the cup final. You know, we, we mentioned this before, and John mentioned it before about you know the potential you know other manager options, and, and one of the stories being covered in the papers is, is Thomas Tuchel, and now he could stay at Bayern, like Xavi Hernandez is going to stay at, at Barcelona. So it might well be that the options are not necessarily you know all all there, and all the timing might not be aligned. Um, let's talk about Chelsea, John, and um, another win for them tonight again. Cole Palmer. 27 goals, is it, this season? It's absolutely astonishing. And here they are, having been, I think, 11th for pretty much the entirety of the season, and they could actually finish fifth. 
I mean, you know, it's talking about coming up on the rails and Marissa Pochettino getting some late momentum in the season here. Absolutely fantastic, isn't it? I mean, it, po Pochettino has spoken every single week about having a young squad, needing to develop players, getting into a rhythm. And we're finally kind of almost seeing the fruits of, of his labour, aren't we? I mean, there's a nice headline in my paper there, um, by my um, you know, piece by uh, my colleague Alan Smith, but also Poch's Six Machines. Um, really, you know... Fantastic um, uh, sort of uh, run of wins, and then also closing in on that top six finish. So you know, it, I do think they've suddenly changed the outlook completely. I, I still feel as if they've got lots of questions. I mean, it, it was brilliant night for Cole Palmer, but then Rhys James unbelievably gets sent off, so he misses the final game of the season and the first two of next. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? I mean, if it, it, there's almost, it feels like with Chelsea two steps forward and one back at the moment, but they're still <laughs> churning out those wins and still getting it right. And I do I do admire Pochettino. I do hope he turns it round and I do hope he stays. I do still think there's probably some question marks over, over that, whether he does see it out, just simply because does he feel that he's got the backing and the support and everything in place to kind of carry on this end of season momentum right from the start of pre-season and into next season so let's see how that develops but I think Pochettino is showing us at the moment that he can be the perfect fit and he's building a young squad and he's very very good working with young players so obviously you know he, he maybe you know his abilities were cast in some doubt early on but now he's really addressed that and he's got you know getting the, the answers from his place maybe you could also say about Brendan Rodgers and his reputation, David, with Celtic. Very briefly, we're, we're short on time here, but you know, for mm -hmm. him to see off the threat of, of Philippe Clement and Rangers when they were on a train and then to clinch the title in some style at Kilmarnock. Yeah, a Kilmarnock side that have beat them twice already this season and were on really good form going away there. And um, Brendan Rodgers has come under a lot of scrutiny in recent times up in Scotland. And um, he's answered some critics. He's He's got another league title under, under the belt. And... Uh, from what I hear, they'll look to in, invest in the market in the summer, back him and, and try and make a real impact again next season domestically and in Europe. So, yeah, fair play to Brendan Rodgers. He's a really good coach and, and he's got another piece of silverware to his name. And, and the Celtic fans will rightly be delighted that they've seen off Rangers and uh, are closing in on, on levelling. I think they're one away from uh, equaling Rangers' record tally now. So happy times on uh, one half of Glasgow. Fantastic. We'll call it a day there. Thank you very much indeed, guys.